Good morning. Please come in and find a seat. <clears throat> Let's get started. We're about to begin worship, so I'd love to see you running to the seats so that you can get right to worship right away. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Foothill Christian Fellowship. Uh, we will start our uh, corporate worship together with song. Uh, we'll move to, uh, of course, scripture reading as a local body of Christ, praying together corporately, and then sitting under the preached word of God. Uh, what a privilege that is. Uh, God has revealed himself to us in his word, put it in writing. You know, they talk about it in, in the business world. Well, put it in writing, show it to me in writing. And God did just that and preserved it over 40 authors, 1400 years of writing. And now what another practically 2000, um, amazing gift that we have in God's word. We're gonna read God's word a little bit later. Uh, I wanted to call your attention to Romans 8, <clears throat> 22, part of the scripture reading. We know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit in us, even we groan within ourselves, eagerly, uh, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, for in hope we have been saved. Well, let's stand, express that hope, sing because of that hope, right? And let's worship God. Please stand together. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's a blessing to read God's word today. So hopefully you're all there at Romans 8, starting in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Thank you, and you may be seated. Please bow your heads with me as we... Our gracious creator and redeemer, our sufferings are never as great as our sin. And we consider that the sufferings of this present time, whatever trials we may endure, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The glory of knowing you as you are, the glory of being redeemed from the place of sin and sadness, of sickness, of death. The whole creation eagerly waits for the revealing of your redeemed people. The land longs to be ruled over by man as was your original purpose. And in your sovereignty, you subjected both the land and the man to corruption but with a certain hope that one day a seed would be born from the woman who would bring God's people back into God's land under your blessing and your rest forever and ever. 
We thank you for the freedom that is ours in Christ, for the glory that is to come, and we join in the groaning of creation as well, eagerly awaiting for our full redemption, to have the redemption of our bodies, that you would redeem our lowly body to be like Jesus's glorious body. You have promised to do it. We know that you are faithful. We know that you do not change and that no one can thwart your plan or your purposes. We were saved in hope. It is a hope that we do not fully see now, but we will fully see Jesus, our hope, very soon and forever. Grant us perseverance as we eagerly wait for the completion of your salvation plan. May you be glorified as the God who reigns and we will reign with you forever. Praise to your name. Amen. By way of announcement, on October 3rd, we have a whole slew of things happening on October the 3rd. We have uh, in order, if I'm thinking of this right, we're going to have our fellowship meal. And just following that fellowship meal or during that time, there's going to be a membership class. If you want to be a part of that, you can contact the office. And just following the fellowship meal and the membership class, we're going to have our members quarterly meeting. So those of you who are members plan to attend that. It'll be at 1.30 p.m. That's on October the 3rd. Uh, also, our holiday choir is going to be assembling and practicing. This is going to be on October the 10th that they'll start uh, meeting on Sundays at 1230, from 1230 to 1:30. So October 10th is the first practice. If you want to sign up for that, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer, or you can talk to Daryl, who led us in song this morning. Uh, also, we want to announce we have two people that are going to be leaving our fellowship here. Well, one for a while. Daniel, you should come back. Daniel Borlean is going to be moving to be nearer to family. So he is over here in the blue shirt. So make sure you put a hug on this guy. He uh, has been a great encouragement to me in uh, men's prayer and Sunday morning prayer, which means we have an open seat for men's prayer on Friday at 6 a.m. or uh, our prayer meeting at, seven, or at 8 a.m. You can show up at 7 if you want. Uh, at 8 a.m. we pray together. It'll take uh, at least three of you to fill his place. Uh, also, Stephen Haler, uh, who just recently became an Eagle Scout, is also joining the Army, which is awesome. So you give him a strong handshake. <laughs> Uh, he'll be stationed in Missouri, which I think is properly pronounced Missouri. He'll be there for four months, and Lord willing, he'll be returning with the ability to explode C4, which is awesome. <laughs> so, hug Daniel, give Stephen a handshake, be praying for him. All right. This morning, we're going to be returning to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Oh, kids. <laughs> kids, you can go. Everybody who's staying, 1 Peter 3.18 is where we're going. Uh, we're going to be uh, a little bit in 1 Peter 3 and a lot in Genesis 6 throughout this message. Uh, so you get a little bit of the background of what Peter is connecting to and talking about the days of Noah. Uh, we had discussed last week how this is a difficult text that we're looking at. 
It's not difficult because scripture is unclear, but it's difficult because we're unclear about a clear text. And we just have to take time to work ourselves clear, which is why we're not going through this passage really fast. You'll notice in the sermon title and the bulletin, this is part two. And there will be a part three, and maybe more, but maybe just a part three. We'll see what happens. There are some things in scripture that take a lot of effort to understand, but since they are revealed to us in scripture, we can understand them. God has given them to us so that we could know them and uh, worship him for the things that are here. Uh, I want you to listen to what Peter says about Paul's writings in 2 Peter. He says, count the patience of our Lord as salvation just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. When I read that, I say, Peter, there are some things in your letter which are hard to understand. But we pray that God would help us to not be ignorant of these things or unstable in God's word, but that he would give us knowledge and stability in it, uh, which is you know, part of what we were singing about. He's our rock in the raging storm. We can change we can stand on him because he's the unchanging God. His character doesn't change. His plan doesn't change. I think I'm going to say that 30 times or so in this message. Why does God give us really super difficult text in the Bible? I think one of the reasons is to make us to, to see our desperation for God to help us. Uh, also, to, to bend our hearts in prayer to him, to ask for his help, and to have the joy of seeing him answer our prayer and give us understanding of a difficult text. It's also, I think, to shepherd us to be a thinking people and to be a people who seek to know God's thoughts. We want to think about everything in life the way that God teaches us to think about it. And we know that God has given us a book and this book educates us on our desperation for God, for his salvation, for knowledge, for wisdom, for understanding. It's a book that leads us to pray in earnest to God to give us understanding, to think hard and to strive to read well. Striving to read the Bible well and to think hard about the theology that's in the Bible is worship. We love the Lord our God with all our mind. And by way of prayer this morning, I just want to pray a couple of verses from Psalm 119. Our Lord, how I love your law. It is the meditation of my mind all day. We pray that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law, even in 1 Peter and Genesis. Amen. We're going to focus primarily on verses 19 and 20, but I'll read this whole paragraph as we begin this morning. So starting in 318. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were safely, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Peter is writing to suffering Christians to encourage them to stand firm in their faith with their hope set on Jesus' salvation. You remember I tried to argue that hope is not only the central word of this epistle, but it's the central theme throughout. Salvation produces hope amidst 
suffering. And our faith in God produces virtue. This is what Peter talks about in his second letter in the first chapter, how virtue is paired with knowledge of salvation. And when we grow in knowledge, we gain a self-controlled life in how we think and how we feel and how we live. And self-control strengthens us to endure, and endurance produces godliness, godliness, brotherly, brotherly affection, brotherly affection, love, and all of those quality, qualities circle back to our knowledge of God. And it's growing in the knowledge of God that we grow in our effectiveness in following Him, our fruitfulness for His kingdom. And this pattern that is in 2 Peter chapter 1 is the pattern of thinking that's laid out in the verses that we're considering this morning. This is the thinking behind why Peter writes about Christ proclaiming his victory to the spirits in prison. We'll be talking about who the spirits in prison are later. And God's glory revealed in salvation through judgment in the days of Noah. When we grow in the knowledge of how salvation works, it produces hope, and hope produces endurance. Gospel victory endures from age to age. And when we see God being victorious in his gospel, it strengthens us to endure. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In his character and his plan, he is immutable, which I think that is the only point I'm going to make in this sermon. It is this, gospel victory endures because God is immutable. Gospel victory endures because God is immutable. If that's a new, new word to you, immutable just means unchangeable. And it's in regard, if you, if you were to write that, you're right, immutable equals unchanging and from unchanging, you can draw two little arrows. One goes to character, and the other one goes to plan. He's unchanging in his character and in his plan. If you get that, I will have been successful. So when Peter writes about Jesus, how he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison his victory, because they didn't formally obey in the days of Noah when the ark was being prepared, and eight persons, Noah and his family, being brought safely through the water, uh, one of the first questions we have is, Peter, what are you talking about? Well, he's talking about God's unchangeable character and being both judge and savior, God's unchangeable plan of salvation, which was not overcome back in this time period of Noah or in the time of Peter, nor in the day in which we live. Peter is making the point that God's righteousness is revealed in salvation through judgment. And you might think about how this plays out in the book of Romans in the first three chapters where we read about God's righteousness. He says God's righteousness is revealed in his wrath against all ungodliness and how God's righteousness is revealed in Christ in justification by faith. God is unchanging in his character and his plan of judging the unrighteous and rescuing the righteous, which is a story that Peter loves to tell. We're going to spend most of our time this morning considering what happened in the days of Noah to get the point of Peter's paragraph here. But before we see this story of the time of Noah, we need to travel back all the way to Genesis 3.15. So if you join me in the First Testament in Genesis 3.15, we'll begin there. Genesis 3.15, Yahweh God speaking to the serpent after the fall proclaims his victory. Well, start in verse 14. Yahweh God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock 
and above all beast of the field on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel. Immediately following the event where sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, Yahweh God declared gospel victory over Satan's mascot, the serpent. Satan was cursed for reversing God's creation order where the beast of the field ruled over woman and woman then ruled over man because Satan was jealous of mankind being the crown and glory of God's creation and wanted to get back at God through man. But how did that turn out for the serpent? Well, the mascot put on his belly to remind him that he never won and he would never win. He would always be in the position of being under God's feet. And for the first time in history, we read of the phrase that we're familiar with, eat my dust. And it was God who said it. God made the devil and God made the dust. The devil is his devil and will eat his dust of defeat forever. But before the realized finality of that defeat would come, there would be a war between two families, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. A war between two families with two different family heads. The seed of the woman, we read, will one day deliver a fatal crushing blow to the head of the seed of the serpent. So if you get crushed on the head, you die forever. But if you get crushed on the heel, you can recover from that, which the seed of the woman would. This, in this text, we see a pattern of salvation. Suffering comes first, then glory. The serpent will always exist at head crushing height because he can never go head to head with the creator of all things. He can only go head to heel because everything is subject under the feet of God. And God knows how to judge the unrighteous, which we see in this text, and he knows how to rescue the righteous, as we see in Genesis 3, verse 21. So you look over the verse 21. The verse says, and Yahweh God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. So this is God's righteous salvation. So the unrighteous would receive head crushing judgment, but the righteous a covering for their shame. On that day in Genesis 3:21, an, an innocent animal died. Maybe it was a lamb. The animal didn't deserve the death that came to it. The animal didn't commit any sin against God. Adam and Eve did, but the animal died in their place. Also, Adam and Eve didn't deserve the covering that they received. This is a summary of salvation. Uh, you might remember from last week how we talked about salvation as penal substitutionary atonement. You remember God said to Adam, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die, right? That's the penalty. They deserve death. But we see what happened was there was a substitute who died in their place, which would make atonement by providing them some sort of covering for their shame. This is a picture of how one day God's going to vindicate his righteousness because otherwise Satan and the fallen angels can say, well, when we sinned against you, you just booted us out of heaven forever. But when they sinned, you clothed them. That's not fair. Well, God's going to vindicate himself 
through his son and the elect angels longed to see how that was going to work out and the prophets wanted to know when is all of this stuff going to happen? When does the seed of the woman get born? God's righteous wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Romans 1.18 But God's righteous salvation is revealed in Christ whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. It's a substitutionary atonement there to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Some will be judged under the heel of the promised seed who is the Christ. Others will be rescued by being covered in something that God would provide. We see that in Genesis 3 in an animal skin. They would be in the skin and atoned for. Uh, we see that with Noah in his, in his day being in the ark and being saved from judgment. When we come to a book like Ephesians, we read of being in Christ and saved from judgment. As history goes on from Genesis 3 to our time, we know that some will be in the cursed family and others will be in the blessed family. We know that God knows how to judge the unrighteous and rescue the righteous. As you keep going through Genesis, when you come to Genesis chapter 5, we're reminded again that just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And as you go through this chapter and you kind of scan through it, you see sin's song after each verse repeats the chorus, and he died. God said to Adam, you will surely die. And all of those who are in Adam, guess what happens? They die, and they die, and they die. Death is a problem for children of Adam. So the question is raised, how do you escape the death problem? If you look at 521, we read, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So you say, hey, here's a guy who escaped the death problem somehow. How did he do it? He walked with God. So, well, that's interesting. So now, like, well, how, how does somebody enter into that relationship with God? What does it look like? Well, that's where we come to Genesis chapter 6, where we're going to learn more about Noah and the days that he lived in. So this is when Peter refers to in the days of Noah and the spirits in prison, this is the, peri the time period that he's talking about. So remember, there's a battle between two families, that of the serpent, that of the seed of the woman. So what was the seed of the woman up to at this time in well, let's see. We're going to look at the seed of the serpent first. What was the seed of the serpent up to during this time? Let's read the first four verses there in chapter 6. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then Yahweh said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So the most difficult text in the New Testament in 1 Peter 3 quotes the most difficult text in the First Testament in Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to try to make it clear to you. 
So what's the seed of the serpent doing during this time? They're trying to stop the promised seed of the woman from being born. So you got to get Genesis 3.15, have a big star next to it, and understand everything in your Bible is about that verse. The seed of the serpent's trying to corrupt everything on earth so that the promised son of man would never be born. And there's this group called the sons of God in this passage. And there's, this is kind of a, f a familiar phrase, the sons of God saw. Last time we read this, we read Eve saw. You remember what she saw? She saw forbidden fruit. You're not supposed to eat that stuff. Well, the sons of God, they saw also forbidden fruit, which was these daughters of men. Angels are not given in marriage. Jesus talked about this. He said it's forbidden, which I kind of just tipped my hand and answered the question on who the sons of God are, but I'll also make a little bit of an argument for it. Uh, these sons of God were corrupting God's good gift of marriage in order to destroy what God established as the foundation of society. And you're probably thinking, he's still doing that today. The serpent wanted to thwart the be fruitful and multiply creation mandate given to man in order to stop God's salvation plan. Because remember, God's salvation plan was be fruitful and multiply to spread his glory to the ends of the earth. Satan is at war against God's people, carrying out that great commission of spreading God's glory to the ends of the earth. So who are the sons of God in Genesis 6? I already told you, but we'll talk about it a little bit more because you're curious. Some say they are aliens or dynastic warriors. Maybe they're the sons of Seth. Maybe they're the sons of Cain or fallen angels or fallen angels who possessed human bodies. This phrase, sons of God, shows up in another book which was actually written before Genesis that has the phrase sons of God in it several times. What book was written before Genesis? Job, all right, good. In Job, the phrase sons of God consistently means angels. So we know that during this time period when people heard this phrase, that's what they were thinking about. Here's an example from Job 1.6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh and Satan also came among them. So it's like, well, who are the sons of God? They're the fallen angels who are under Satan. Peter, when he's talking about the spirits in prison, he's talking about these fallen angels, these fallen sons of God. And I'll have you turn over to 2 Peter. So keep your finger here at Genesis 6, but just look over at 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5. And when it comes to understanding Genesis 6 and what, what is Peter talking about with these spirits, this verse is very clear on the matter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. For if God did not spare angels, there we go. So that kind of really solves our problem. We don't have to worry about what all the scholars think. Peter's a better scholar than all the scholars combined, right? He says they're angels. And when they sinned, he says, but God... Cast them into hell, which you probably have a little teeny tiny number one or something. And then there's a footnote to the answer key of the Bible that says Tartarus. This is a unique place that refers to a spirit prison. So make sure you look up the, the little footnotes in your Bible. That's the answer key to what the translators wish they could put in the, the text, but they thought they would confuse you if they put it there. So he committed them into Tartarus and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And listen to this. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So back to Genesis 6. Who are the sons of God in Genesis 6? They are angels. Did they inhabit human bodies? 
It doesn't say explicitly, but I think so. And that's my opinion. You can take that for whatever that's worth. So why did these angels, these sons of God, procreate with women? Well, some, some people suggest that their purpose is to create a hybrid race to destroy the image of God in man, which would make it impossible for a true human seed and savior to ever be born because there wouldn't be a human race. There would be this other thing. Others suggest that their purpose was to make the earth so corrupt that God would just destroy the entire creation, thus getting rid of the display of the likeness of God in mankind that Satan was so jealous of. Any way about it, whichever option you want to pick there, God is sovereign over the fallen angels, and he continues to carry out the gospel victory that he promised all the way back in Genesis 3 15. So, what did God do in Genesis 6 and respond to in responding to the sons of God? Well, it says of man, his days shall be 120 years. This is another one of those curious phrases in Genesis 6. I'll start with what it does not mean. It does not mean that you can go live in the woods with a faith healer and you'll live to be 120 if you have enough faith in apple cider vinegar. Does not mean that. I'm glad y'all understand that. <laughs> it does mean that God put a limit on the evil of those days and the limit was 120 years. 120 years was the time between then and the global flood. On this day, a ticking water time bomb was set with the number 120 years. And when that water bomb would ignite, the God of creation would not separate the waters from the waters as he did in the beginning of the creation, but he would also be the God of decreation and the waters would come out of the earth and out of the sky and smash everything under his judgment. Once again, we see in scripture that God knows how to judge the unrighteous and that he has put a limit on their evil. So we read of the defeat of fallen angels and the victory of God, which he proclaimed in Genesis 3.15, which he proclaims in Genesis 6. So instead of these fallen angels corrupting the human race so much that the promised seed would never be born, all that happened was these people called the Nephilim. In other words, tall people. They got tall people. That was it. So it's like, ah, we're going to make this great battle plan against God and overcome. And then God kind of mocks them and says, look what you got, tall people. Also note that the text says, in those days. Do not call your tall friends in these days Nephilim. They, they lived in those days, not these days. Tall as they were, everything remains in subjection to God's invincible salvation plan. These fallen angels thought that they could thwart God's plan, but all they got was tall people in those days. That was God declaring his victory over them. This is like Jesus going to these sons of God who were kept in a special prison and going to them and proclaiming, you tried to stop me in Genesis 6 and it didn't happen. You tried to stop me at the cross, it didn't happen. I was wounded on the heel, but I recovered. I was dead, I am raised, I am here to proclaim my victory. Your master is still on his belly under my feet. You will be crushed forever. That's what happens in 1 Peter 3, 19. That's the point that he's making to encourage the suffering saints who are getting ready to be persecuted under immense persecution under Emperor Nero to remind them that the serpent is still on his belly. Genesis 3.15, gospel victory endures unthwarted by the evil of fallen angels. But 
As we keep going through Genesis chapter 6, we read it's not only the fallen angels who were evil, but also if you look at chapter 6, verse 5, it says Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, what did Yahweh see? He saw sinful men with sinful hearts on the earth and that the thoughts of his heart, usually we attach feelings to the heart, but you read here in this text, text thoughts attached to the heart. It says they were only evil continually, no exceptions. The heart, as we've discussed, is the center of man's thinking, his feeling, and his doing. And this is one of those famous passages that teach what we call the doctrine of total depravity, which we see the two elements of total depravity in Genesis 5 and Genesis 6. Those two elements being we're guilty of sin, so we die. We're corrupted by sin, so we sin. Sin affects our entire person. It affects how we think, it affects how we feel, it affects how we live our lives. And apart from salvation in Christ, the only thing a person can do is evil continually. So what is the heart of the problem that's addressed in Genesis 6? The human heart is the heart of the problem. Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 6. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Do you recognize this about yourself, about your own heart? Not do you recognize, recognize this about other people. I'm sure you can think about all sorts of other people that you think evil comes out of them, but not yourself. But this describes you and them. Have you not had your own lustful thoughts? Have you not had your own pondered thefts or murderous thoughts or thinking a brother to be a fool or your own desiring more than what God has given you and coveting something that God has just chosen not to give you? Have you had your own thoughts where you lied and just pitched the story in your own favor to make you look as good as you think that you are? Or your own thoughts on how you could make somebody else look really bad and you really good. Or your own elevated, inflated sense of what you do for others and what they don't do for you. Or your own self-pity over people not elevating you the way that you elevate yourself in your heart. Our human hearts are far more perplexingly evil than we could ever comprehend. And the fact that we can't fully comprehend it is part of the effects of sin. We're so evil that we actually come up with all sorts of reasons why our evil is actually good, in our minds at least. The problem of the heart is the human heart. So if there's to, to be any true gospel victory, what does God need to overcome? The human heart. The human heart has to be overcome if there's ever to be any true gospel victory. I hope that you see that our issue isn't external when it comes to sin, but it's internal. Uh, we can't blame our sin on the woman that you gave me or, well, so-and-so did this. That's why I did what I did. Or it's just how I, I was raised or it was just the environment that I was in. Or if it hadn't been for this one thing, I wouldn't have done that. The problem is not external to us, it's internal. 
which is going to be important for understanding what Peter means by baptism when we get to that next week, Lord willing. Sinful men need a supernatural internal transformation of their heart, which is something that only God can accomplish, and he graciously does so. You can wash the entire outside of the earth clean of evil and have only your family left on the planet and still have internal sin problems. Remember Noah after the flood, laying drunk in his tent after a misuse of the fruit. Even our greatest heroes and examples in the Bible who lived out their faith in God are still imperfect, sinful men who needed salvation, which is an encouragement to us and a reminder that this saying is trustworthy and true that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You're a sinner. He's a savior. Well, how did the heart of God respond to the heart of man? We read of this in Genesis 6, 6 through 7. Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. We tend to misunderstand a statement like that and thinking, oh, God got upset all of a sudden, and now he's changing his plan because of what happened. Uh, we tend to misunderstand a statement like this in Scripture because we tend to think about God in a backwards way because of our internal heart corruption. When we first read a statement like this, we may tend to think about what regret or being grieved is like for us, and then we project that onto God. This is called doing theology from below, where we start with an understanding of ourselves, and then we assume that God is just like us, but he's greater. The error of doing theology from below is that we end up creating a God in our likeness. The way that we ought to do theology is from above. God is in a category of his own. You might think of Exodus 3.14 where he revealed himself as I am who I am. He is a pure being who is never becoming. He is who he is. He is the great I am. He will be who he will be unchangingly. Here is one way that God is different than us, which we're going to talk about that. I want you to think about how we change in our character and plan when things happen. Uh, he doesn't change in his character or his plan. When we talk about this or you read about this in theology books, the theological term is immutability. God's immutability has to do with his unchangingness in his character and his plan, his unchangingness in who he is and what he does. So for example, he is righteous in his character and he can't be changed in his righteous character by anything that's outside of him. He also has an unchanging plan of salvation and he, his plan of salvation cannot change because of anything that's outside of himself. God cannot change in his character or his plan. He is immutable. I want you to think about how this truth strengthens your heart to love God and to endure in this life. In Malachi 3.6, it says, For I, Yahweh, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Because God does not change in his character or his plan, you can trust him that 
he's not going to change his salvation plan. He's still going to carry it out despite what men do on the earth. Here's a passage you'll be more familiar with from James 1.17. James, speaking of trials, writes this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Because God doesn't change in his character, being light, or his plan, you can know that every trial that comes in your life is a good and perfect gift that comes from a God who doesn't change. So we tend to think when a trial happens, this is bad, this is imperfect. But we need to remember, God is good, God is perfect. He gives good and perfect gifts like trials to conform us into his image. Because God does not change in his character or his plan, we can trust him in these things. And you can receive in faith these words from Charles Spurgeon. Quote, remember this, had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, divine love would have put you there. End quote. I can still see that quote hanging on the wall of some of my friend's apartment and remember thinking back to that truth after they endured a, a miscarriage in their family. And it was in a time like that that it was needful to remember a truth like Spurgeon says in that quote, to remember divine love is good, God's good character. That doesn't change. To remember that where he put you in his plan is his perfect will. When we think about the painful things that happen in life, we have to remember God's divine love hasn't changed. He put me here in this circumstance today, and it's good. I can trust him. Remember this. Had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, Divine love would have put you there. God is good, immutably good in his character and his plan. Herman Bavink, who's one of my favorite Reformed Dutch theologians to read on this topic, says, if God were not immutable, he would not be God. I want you to think about this for a moment. If, if anything in God's creation can do something to change who God is or what God does, then that thing is God over God because that thing puts God in subjection to itself. The moment that you believe that something in creation can affect a change in God's character or in God's plan, you will inevitably, in your practice at least, worship that thing as God. Another quote from Bob Inc., he says, the difference between the creator and the creature hinges on the contrast between being and becoming. Just write that down, sit back in your chair, fold your arms, and think about it. That's what you got to do with that kind of quote. So he's saying the creator is a being. He doesn't change in who he is, but the creature is different than the creator in that the creature becomes things. I'm going to try to make that more clear. God is who he is perfectly all the time and is never becoming anything because he's entirely independent from his creation. God is perfectly self-sufficient, not depending on anything outside of himself for anything. But as creatures, we become things when something happens to us. So when unjust evil happens to us or we see it going on in the world, we become something. Uh, we become angry or we become grieved or we, we become disappointed. But 
God as creator perfectly is who he is even when things change in the world from our perception. When God sees unjust evil going on in the world, he remains perfectly holy. He remains perfectly hating evil and perfectly loving righteous, righteousness, perfectly judging unrighteousness, and he will also perfectly deliver the righteous because he perfectly is who he is, unchangingly, immutably. But because we are finite creatures who do change, we're limited in our comprehension of God's attributes. Something that appears to be changing to time-bound creatures like us doesn't necessitate a change in the eternal God. So from our perspective, statements like Yahweh regretted or it grieved him appears like a change to us time-bound creatures, but in reality, the eternal, immutable God doesn't change. And I recognize this is, if you think, I don't, I don't know if I'm following all of this. This is hard to understand. You're right. It takes about three months for this to, well, at least it took that long to soak into my head. Uh, maybe you'll get it a little bit sooner. But I have an illustration to help you. So think about how from our perspective, we're going to see the sun go down tonight. But the sun isn't going to stop being the sun just because we can't see it. From our per perception, it just went away. But that doesn't mean that it isn't there anymore. Uh, or to think about, well, one day it's going to cool off. I know it's really hot still, but one day it'll cool off. But just because things feel cooler maybe in December, doesn't mean that the sun isn't hot anymore. From our perception, things are cooler, but the, the sun is still hot, even when you perceive that things feel cooler while being under the sun. While there might be a change in our perception of our relations to God, there is no change in God because he's unchanging. This is why God is called the rock can't remember the word immutable, just remember God is a rock. And that his stability, or wait, your, his immutability is your stability. Or the other way around, your stability is his immutability. Tell Hobby Lobby to make that into some artwork. <laughs> the immutable, unchanging rock is our God, and we can stand on that firm foundation when the gates of hell war against God's creation. You see why I like the doctrine of immutability so much? Because it helps your heart to, to rest when you see all hell breaking loose on the earth. So I'm going to belabor this point, but it's a good one to belabor. So how do you understand a statement like this? You know, Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. We understand a phrase like that similar to how we understand a phrase like the eyes of Yahweh. We know that God is a spirit and has not a body like men. He doesn't have eyes like we have eyes. But God uses analogical language like eyes to accommodate our limited knowledge capacity so that we may understand. You might think of the difference of uh, an adult saying goo goo gaga to a little baby, right? Because the little baby can only understand so much. So you, you speak in a different way in which the little baby can understand. In this analogy, God is the parent, and you're the little baby who has trouble understanding. So he speaks in a way that helps you to understand what he's talking about. I just called you all babies. I'm sorry. I should have thought about that one ahead of time. Likewise, this is how we understand a phrase like, it grieved him. Uh, we don't think, just like we think, oh, it says the eyes of Yahweh. We don't think, well, God has eyes like we have eyes. When we read it grieved him, we don't think, oh, God has grief like us. 
He has grief, but it's different than us because he's an unchanging being, but we are changing beings. You can't understand a phrase like, it grieved him without first understanding who you are talking about. He must first remember that he's the God who is independent from all things, so the creation can't change anything in him, and that he's immutable in his character and his plan. He is unchanging in who he is, but to changeable creatures, our perception may be that God became grieved. And our perception might be, it looks like he's changing course now because he's going to flood the entire planet, but he's not changing course. This is something that he had planned before the foundations of the earth, which brings us to rest in his sovereign care. Just because you can't see the light because it went behind the mountains doesn't mean that there's no more light. Just because you perceive darkness in the world doesn't mean that the true light isn't already shining. He is the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He is the same in Noah's day yesterday. He's the same in our day today. And he will be the same unchanging God in his character and plan tomorrow. Now, when it comes to studying the doctrine of immutability, digging out the gold and profit of this doctrine may be hard work, but it's hard work that makes one rich toward God, and it has a measurable blessing in this life in and the next. Uh, if you're encouraged by this discussion of God's immutability and you want to read more, there is a book called None Greater that's on the book spinner back there. It's called None Greater, The Undomesticated Attributes of God. I commend that book to you. Or there's another book called Essential Christian Doctrine. It looks like there's one left, but it's a, another theology book where you can just read through the attributes of God one by one and be blessed by it. Think about theology books as real devotionals. You know, we talk, people talk like these little devotionals. Just like, forget that. Set those devotional books are systematic theology books. We cannot comprehend God fully, but we can comprehend him truly, which helps us to understand, you know, verses like what we're considering right now. And understanding that he doesn't change in his character and plan, it gives us hope. Because when we think, it looks like everything's just going to fall apart and that Christ isn't going to reign like he said that he would. But it gives us hope to, be, to go back and say, victory, Genesis 3. Victory, Genesis 6. Victory, 1 Peter 3. Victory, Revelation, right? God's love for his creation does not change. The Genesis 3.15 promise does not change. His saving power does not change. His faithfulness never wavers. He will always hate evil and deal with it righteously. He will always be holy and never unholy. He will always be a perfect redeemer. And though the world may change in to great evil, God will remain the same from age to age, working all things according to the counsel of God of his will. The heart of God is grieved over the corruption of his creation more than you and I ever could be. And he can actually do something about it. And he will. What we read about in Genesis 6 is that man's heart is filled with evil, but God's heart is filled with grief over men's evil hearts. And God cares about what's happening in the world, and he's going to act. His love story of redeeming his bride is going to continue. He will bring salvation through judgment. God is not indifferent to evil, and we need to remember that in our day. Gospel victory endures because God is immutable, and he does not change in his character or his plan. God knows how to judge the unrighteous and how to rescue the righteous, and he will do it. The recipients of Peter's letter, then and us 
who read it now, we ought to be encouraged by this truth, that gospel victory endures even when Yahweh sees that there's great wickedness on the earth. He sees it. He knows. He's going to do something about it. But it's not just wickedness that Yahweh saw during the days of Noah. He also saw the righteous, and he saw the righteous through his grace, which I'm referring to Noah here, and we'll just briefly consider that. And verse 8, chapter 6, verse 8. It reads, but Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. You might have the word favor there. It's the word grace. And it's the first time that the word grace shows up in the Bible. Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. So what made the difference between the corrupt on the earth and the, and the ones who would be called righteous? God's grace. Verse 9, it says, these are the generations of Noah whose name means rest, says Noah was a righteous man. This is the first time that the word righteous shows up in the Bible. And you must recognize that grace came before righteousness. God showed grace to the man, and then this man lived a righteous life. He was turned into a good tree before he bore good fruit. Now, what does, how should we understand what it means to be a righteous man? Well, here's a definition. He was blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, like his great-great-grandfather Enoch. So God's grace makes all the difference in somebody's life to produce the fruit of righteousness, of trusting and obeying God. How does... What happened in the days of Noah fit with why Peter is bringing up this story in Genesis 6 to his audience. Well, I want you to just consider Peter's day. We know that there was persecution under government, under employer, within marriage, from friends, from family. But listen to how what Peter wrote in 1 Peter could echoes what is said in Genesis 6, starting in verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. There was corruption in Noah's day. There was corruption in Peter's day. But there was also deliverance in Noah's day, which means there's going to be deliverance in Peter's day. Same for us. We see, hey, there's corruption in our day, which means we should also remember there's going to be deliverance in our day. Peter is saying, think. Get your mind into the incorruptible ark of God. You are in Christ, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. So let's turn back over to 1 Peter 3, 19. And now with all of this said, listen to these verses again. 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. Speaking of Christ, in which... Christ went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. God's unchanging love and unchanging salvation plan will continue according to plan. 
Nothing will stop it. We don't need to have our minds too fixed on the things of this corruptible earth, but to have our minds put into that which is incorruptible. And notice how verse 20 ends with a statement about how Noah and his family were brought safely through. This is Peter saying, you're going to be brought safely through. The pattern of salvation worked that way in Genesis 3. It worked that way in Genesis 6. It still works that way. Your circumstances and your feelings about things might have changed amidst your suffering, but God hasn't changed one bit. Gospel victory endures because of God's immutable character and plan. God knows how to judge the unrighteous and to deliver the righteous. So what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? With that, let's pray as the music team comes forward. Our sovereign creator and redeemer, we wonder at your salvation plan that was planned before the foundations of the earth and that it has never been hindered in the slightest by the serpent, by fallen angels, by corrupt government or corrupt employers or corrupt family and friends persecuting and ostracizing your people. Our Christ is a victorious Christ who not only died but was raised and he has power over death which is the last enemy to be defeated and it will be defeated because you, Jesus, shall reign wherever the sun forever and ever and we wish to stand and to praise you for these truths. May they come into our heart and come out of our mouths in praise to your glorious redemption. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. There are some things in Scripture which are hard to understand and hard to explain. I felt that this morning. But it's our worship to seek to understand them and to know God has given these things to us as a gift that we may know them. I want to end with reading from 2 Peter chapter 2, which I think clarifies some of these truths that we discussed this morning. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority." God knows how to judge the unrighteous and to rescue the righteous, and Jesus shall reign forever. We, save, we serve an amazing God who saves great sinners like us. You're dismissed.